Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. We cover everything major league from spring training to the World Series. We've got your favorite club covered from New York to Boston to L.A. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Welcome in to another edition of the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik, and today is episode number 229 of the Baseball Podcast here on Thursday, August 6th. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We certainly appreciate it. Hopefully, you guys are staying safe out there this week. If you live on the East Coast, hopefully everything is okay after the hurricane came through. I know here in the greater Philadelphia area, we got just about five inches, maybe six inches of rain, depending on where you're located here, all up and down into New York City, Washington, D.C., everybody dealing with uh, quite a bit of rain. So if you're listening to one of those markets, hopefully everything worked out for you okay, and uh, you're finding your way through the work week here. I know uh, my roof decided to leak just a little bit. Uh, I was able to find some spots that I now need to work on, so... Yay for me. Uh, Another house project coming up here as we head into the weekend. But thanks for tuning in once again, everybody. We really appreciate it here. We got a great show lined up for you today. Uh, We're going to be talking about news and notes right off the top here in the show and then get into all of the game action in the following three segments. But right off the top of the bat here, Juan Soto returned to the lineup. He made his debut Wednesday night after being out for uh, the entirety of the season thus far. He tested positive for the coronavirus during opening night and was just now able to return here two weeks later. Uh, We saw him dancing on top of the dugout on Tuesday. And if you haven't seen that video yet, do yourself a favor, head to Twitter, type in Juan Soto dancing and Uh, Just a bonus of the social distancing protocols that we have here is Juan Soto is able to get out on top because I believe he was sitting in the stands, not in the dugout due to being activated, but not yet inserted into the lineup. And one of his teammates hit a home run and he found himself on top of the dugout doing a wacky dance, just doing Juan Soto 20 year old things. But uh, Juan Soto has come out. He has discussed his positive test with the coronavirus Uh, He has been pretty adamant that he feels it is a false positive. Uh, He just basically wants to make it clear to the people out there who think he was being reckless or going out or putting his health in jeopardy, his teammates' health in jeopardy. He was basically trying to clear the air and stated that he was doing everything he could to maintain his safety. He wasn't going out. He wasn't doing anything, breaking the rules or, or anything along those lines. And the reason he believes it was a false positive is because afterwards it is stated that he took three quote unquote rapid results tests, which all came back negative. Now, I'm learning more about some of the Phillies and how there were false positives there. And if Juan Soto really believed that he had a false positive, I just don't understand why he wouldn't be tested every day by Major League Baseball. And if in the subsequent two days or next three days you get back-to-back negatives, doesn't that allow him to return to the lineup? So why did we have to wait for two weeks? Did he just not want to take additional tests from Major League Baseball and wanted to wait the two weeks? Or if it really was or he really is that confident that it's a false positive, I just don't understand why it still took two weeks for him to return when we've seen some other individuals be cleared, uh, as well as football in the NFL. We saw Matt Stafford, the quarterback for the Detroit Lions, originally be put on the COVID list. Uh, About four days later, he is now off the list because it has come out that he has been tested and has come back negative three times in a row. So there are the potential for false positives. That is a thing when you're testing these 
uh, you know, these athletes in this grade of a number, you are going to have that small percentage of mistakes. Again, I just don't understand where the communication was that, hey, if you're 100% sure it's a false positive and you're taking all these rapid results tests on your own and they're coming back negative, just call up Rob Manfred. I don't know. Tweet at him. You're Juan Soto. You won the World Series. I'm assuming you have somebody's contact information who you can get into touch with that can get you testing to get back on the field as quickly as possible. But nevertheless, he's back on Wednesday night. Uh, We'll get into how he performed and uh, some other Washington national storylines that continue to be very pressing here as of late Wednesday evening, as of time of recording. But uh, continuing around our news and notes section for the time being, I I jotted this one down because it just made me chuckle as if, Hey, this is 2020. This is what we're dealing with. And that was when the Twins and Pirates game on Tuesday night was delayed due to a drone flying above the field. And both teams came out of their dugouts. People in the bullpens were throwing baseballs at it to try to knock it out of the air. (laughs) Nobody was able to connect with it. But this drone was actually flying and quote unquote, unauthorized airspace and that's any sporting event above it you can't fly over it unless you're you know the the u.s military during the national anthem at the beginning of the game but uh, you're not allowed to fly over it so this drone was in unauthorized airspace Uh, they were able to finally remove it from the vicinity uh, eventually but uh, there have been instances of this happening in the past because basically I was like okay what the heck happens now I I don't think I've ever realized that this has happened but you do some digging and it looks like some individuals did it for some college football games there was an NFL game in the past uh, that had a drone being flown over it and it seems to be that the fine comes out for the individual for about a thousand dollars fifteen hundred bucks Something like that, it's known that people tend to appeal and that fine will get reduced, whether it was 1500 down to, I think, 800 or 1000 down to 600 But either way, it's going to be $500, $1,000 for this individual and whatever type of pictures or video they were trying to get. I just... Did you not think they were going to see the drone? I mean, there's nobody in the stands. I get that. So... It, I, it's just, I don't get it. So, uh, but uh, is there anything more 2020 than the fact that we had a game uh, postponed for a handful of minutes because we had to allow for the drone or figure out how to get the drone out of the airspace until we could continue? So, uh, we'll find out who that individual is coming up here shortly, I'm very sure. Uh, but he or she is looking at uh, a pretty little fine here, potentially up to uh, four figures moving forward. So uh, jumping down the list, now we're going to jump into a bit of the injuries that uh, continue to take place around Major League Baseball. Shohei Otani for the LA Angels. He continues to have arm issues in his career. It's frustrating to watch uh, from a fan's perspective, just knowing the hype that was surrounding Otani as he came over. From Japan, both as a hitter and as a pitcher. I mean, here was a guy who can hit the ball 500 yards or five, not yards, 500 feet and and throw it 95, 100 miles an hour. And he's going to be the next Babe Ruth or the first one since Babe Ruth to do both hitting and pitching at an extremely high level. He could win the Cy Young. He could win the MVP. And we've had three years now, four years of, you know, the pitching side of Otani really just continue to be a letdown. And It's because of this that people are starting to have the conversation around, should he just shut it down as a pitcher and focus on hitting because the injuries from pitching haven't allowed him to focus his complete energy on being a hitter. So his hitting maybe has suffered due to the focus not being completely on it. And it's definitely frustrating because when you look at his pitching career and This most recent injury, I'll state for you guys listening out there, I'm sure you know by now, but it's a grade one to two flexor strain in the elbow. So it doesn't seem to be that Tommy John surgery is on the table, uh, but it has been stated by manager Joe Madden that Otani is done pitching for 2020 after I think it was was seven innings, five innings, something along those lines. Uh, he, He missed all of 2019. Due to injury, now he's going to miss all of 2020. Due to injury in 2018, he was promising. He had 50 innings pitched, to a 3-3-3-2 ERA. So people were looking forward to him improving. And then 
the injuries just continue to pile up, and then because of that, does he sit out? Does he get surgery? Does he continue to hit, even though he's going to need surgery eventually? And then what's the time frame of his return? When should they have the surgery? So all of this is yet to be determined based on if they're going to go the rehab route or if he'll need surgery. If he is able to go the rehab route and continue to stay in the lineup, that would be ideal for Angels fans. That way they can still use him in the DH role moving forward. But I don't know. Uh, Next year, I'm thinking to myself, if anything, this guy's got to go to the bullpen. I I think the days of him starting every fifth day trying to throw 80, 100 pitches – are behind him, Uh, but I don't disagree with the fact that he could probably DH and every three days, every two days, come in, give you an eighth inning, give you a big time strikeout when you need it, Uh, use him, you know, leave him in the game as the DH. That way you're still not uh, losing him as a hitter, but uh, he's only going to throw one or two innings late every couple of times a week, maybe three innings per week, something. It's just... You can't do the starting route. We've seen the toll it takes on the body and where you need to be both mentally and physically. And for some reason or another, it's just not working out for Shohei Otani on the hill. So hopefully he can stay healthy enough to uh, contribute offensively. But just a shame once again that uh, he's dealing with arm injuries. So continuing with injuries, let's see. The Braves placed Matt Adams and Ozzie Albies on the injured list. As of Tuesday into Wednesday, both of them went on the 10-day injured list. Uh, Subsequently, Nick Markakis was reinstated from the restricted list. He decided to return to the team after uh, originally sitting out this season over coronavirus concerns. Uh, He is now back, but Albies was only hitting 159 after going two for his last 21. He's got a bruised right wrist uh, that he uh, unfortunately was unable to play through. Uh, Adams, who was being used mainly as the designated hitter, uh, occasionally playing first base, he left with a strained left hamstring. So hamstring for uh, Adams, wrist for Albies. And reinstate Marcakis, but either way, both of those guys going to miss at least a, a couple of weeks with those injuries. I wouldn't be surprised if it's longer than that uh, for either of them, or even if they do come back, uh, they wouldn't be 100% if that were the case. Uh, as well as Tuesday night for the Chicago White Sox, they had a tough night when it comes to injury concerns. Uh, Nick Madrigal, uh, as well as Edwin Encarnacion, Both left Tuesday night's uh, victory over the Brewers with left shoulder injuries. Uh, The 23-year-old Madrigal, he left in the third inning after he was trying to go from first to third on a single up the middle, sliding into third, a little tweak on the shoulder. And then later in the sixth inning, Encarnacion takes a pretty good cut, and, uh, you know, he pulls up a little bit lame holding his left shoulder. So, We'll see, uh, you know, how they bounce back if they get a couple of days off. But uh, Tuesday, certainly a concern if you find yourself in uh, the south side of Chicago listening to this episode out there. Uh, Lastly, Terry Francona, the manager of the Indians, he is still out. He remains out with a gastrointestinal issue. There you go, gastrointestinal issue. He's been out for a couple of months now, or he's been dealing with this for a couple of months and he's now missing his fourth straight game uh, with this issue. But on a, on a more positive note, uh, we can talk about Mike Trout. He hit a home run in his first at-bat back after he was on paternity leave. He and his wife had their first son, a uh, baby boy, Beckham Aaron Trout. And, and, of course, his first game back after a couple of days off in true Mike Trout fashion, hits a low-and-away slider into the the seats in left center at 407 feet, crazy exit velocity. So uh, his dad bod hasn't kicked in just yet, and he still seems to be at the top of his game. Uh, he was quoted on the ESPN podcast about talking how crazy things were at the hospital and what they went through to have this baby and just to now kind of be on the other side and be able to relax and exhale. Uh, he now it can kind of put his concerns on more safety in regards to his job and performing and and less on, you know, the baby, his wife, and and the bigger picture uh, when it comes to all of the uh, potential hazards involved with having a baby right now in the, you know, 2020 in this pandemic. So shout out Mike Trout. He bounces back, goes yard in his first at back bat. Welcome to the dad world. Your dad bod kicks in soon, my man. We'll see you on that side shortly. So uh, Albert Pujols hit number 659. Big home run, 659 
This leaves him one shy of Willie Mays on the all-time home runs list. So Albert certainly slowing up, not the uh, slugger he once was, uh, but he continues to uh, go yard and finds himself one shy of Willie at 660. So countdown there, and if you're watching Albert, the next one will be a big one for him. But uh, lastly here, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, there was a pitch thrown by Dustin May of the L.A. Dodgers on Tuesday night that broke the Internet a little bit. It was in the first inning against Manny Machado. It was a 99-mile-an-hour sinker that moved just over 17 inches horizontally. And if you watch the video online, it starts out kind of right down the middle, ends up about a foot inside. Machado takes a hack at it, realizes by the time it's crossing the plate, I should not have done this. You see him kind of grimace, smirk afterwards, going, oh, my God, that was insane. And no pitch ever thrown, 99 or harder, has moved that far horizontally since baseball has been able to record that type of stuff here in recent years. And I I can't even imagine. Man, I was trying to throw the ball 89 straight, let alone 99 with a foot and a half a run. I I couldn't get a breaking ball to move a foot and a half. This guy's getting a fastball, 99, able to jump out of his hand and dart a foot and a half across the plate. It's just fascinating. So wrapping up the first segment here, uh, we just recently learned that the St. Louis Cardinals have been cleared to play as of Friday this week. So we learned about their recent coronavirus outbreak. There were reports out there that it came from a casino trip in Minneapolis. Some of the individuals on the squad while they were playing the Twins apparently enjoyed themselves out at the casino. People believe where that's where they contracted the virus, brought it back into the clubhouse, multiple positives, Yadier Molina being one of the individuals who test positive. Well, after a few days of negatives, everything seems to be coming back to normal, and they have been cleared to play as of this Friday. So the Phillies are back in action. The Marlins are back in action. Soon the Cardinals can join them and hopefully get everything back to normal when it comes to the Major League Baseball schedule. But that'll wrap it up here for the first segment of the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. We'll pause right now for a word from one of our sponsors and one of our sister shows, but when we come back, we'll start uh, diving around Wednesday night's action here, looking at some of the games, giving you guys updates on where everybody stands here currently. So stick around. We'll be right back. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back, everybody, to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik, and this is episode number 229 of the Baseball Podcast here on Thursday, August 6th. Hopefully, everybody's having a great week out there. If you haven't done so yet, please like, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, Just kind of scroll up, click the star all the way on the right. If you want to hit the little write a review button down there, please do so. Leave us your remarks, your comments. Let us know what you're thinking as we're a couple of weeks in here. Are the Marlins for real? Are the Yankees going to win 45, 50 games? Can somebody upset the Dodgers out in the West? Let us know what you're thinking as we're going to talk about all of that here on the rest of today's episode. So if you haven't done so yet, and I know a lot of you have, please Check us out on Facebook as well as Twitter. Head to the GSMC Baseball podcast page and uh, interact with us there. We'd love to hear from you. We like to uh, keep this a community as much as possible moving forward. But jumping back into today's episode, let's talk about the American League and National League East standings. We'll go East, Central, West, giving you guys an update on everything that's currently taking place as Wednesday night's action 
continues to wrap up here late as of time of recording. But looking at the current division standings, the American League East, we have the New York Yankees in first place at 9-2. and two. Nothing to see here. The Yankees keep on cruising. We're going to get into the game action here in just a minute, but I want to give you the brief overview and then kind of let you know how we got here. So second place right now remains Baltimore at five and six. The Toronto Blue Jays at four and five are in third place. The Tampa Bay Rays at five and seven in fourth place. And then the Boston Red Sox in the basement at four and eight. So just a brief snapshot there. The Yankees, of course, Baltimore at five and six. Okay. They've lost a couple in a row here. Find themselves under 500 now, but the uh, Tampa Bay Rays at five and seven are truly the surprise and the uh, disappointment thus far in the American League East. Now, looking at the National League East side of things, the surprise of Major League Baseball has to be at this point, since they've returned to action and won three straight games, is the Miami Marlins. The Marlins find themselves in first place at 5-1. and one. They were 2-1 and one through the opening weekend against the Phils, had everything shut down. Since then, they've come back, played the Baltimore Orioles, and uh, swept the Orioles. So the Orioles went from 5-3 and three to 5-6, and six, and Miami is now at 5-1 uh, and one at the top of the division. The Atlanta Braves are 8-5, and five, currently in second place. Uh, people, uh, including myself, think they'll eventually overtake the Miami Marlins, but 8-5, uh, and five, solid for the Braves early on. Third place, Washington Nationals at four and five. The fourth place, Philadelphia Phillies at two and four. And the last place, New York Mets currently sitting in the basement at five and eight. Three and a half games back behind the Miami Marlins. So uh, looking at Wednesday night's action for these clubs, the Phillies and Yankees found themselves playing a double a header. Uh, we talked about it in the first segment, the hurricane that came through. Uh, caused a, a lot of havoc on the schedule in the Northeast. So you had double headers actually between the Phillies and Yankees, as well as the Marlins and the Orioles. So a couple of interleague double headers. Let's start out by talking through the Phillies and Yankees. Uh, first couple of games, the Phillies found themselves in almost a, a must win scenario early on. They were one and three coming into action against the Yankees. You had Zach Wheeler on the mound, who is your big offseason addition. Uh, you were at home, but technically the road team against New York. Uh, that's the way this one worked, or both of these opportunities worked. Game one, the Phillies were the road team. Game two, the Yankees were at home. And in Baltimore, game one, the Marlins were the road team. And in game two, they were at home. So you had road teams at home, home on the road. It, it just it was 2020 summed up in a nutshell. The Phillies are in the home dugout, but hitting first, and it just continued to uh, be almost comical at times. But uh, Bryce Harper homered in game one. Uh, he was a big reason why the Phillies were able to get going. The Yankees got out to an early 3 nothing lead due to a Brett Gardner home run in the bottom of the second. Harper bounced back in the top of the third, where the Phillies scored four runs. Uh, you had a couple other walks sprinkled in there. Harper with a two-run shot. Uh, Rio Muto hit a home run in the fifth inning, and then in the sixth inning, the Phillies were able to bust it wide open. Hoskins, single, Harper, Rio Muto, Kingery, Gregorius, and uh, bust it open to make it 11-3. The Yankees closed as Aaron Judge hit another home run. He continues to just absolutely rake. Uh, let's see, 371 feet to left field before ultimately New York fell short, 11-7. In the game one action here. Game two in the nightcap, they did bounce back. The Yankees did, and they won that game three to one. Uh, it was a pitcher's battle through six innings. Aaron Nola on Philadelphia's side through six innings, giving up one run on the Yankees side. They kind of went bullpen by committee. Uh, let's see here. Lozania went, went two and a third, gave up one run. Uh, let's see. Voigt hit a home run to left field to put the Yankees up one nothing. Andrew Knapp brought back the Phillies in the second inning to tie things at one. And then ultimately for the Phillies, it was uh, in the bullpen, um, Tommy Hunter, who was unable to get it out and gave up two runs, who will take the loss. So Aaron Nola, one earned run, 12 strikeouts, no walks in six innings, two strikeouts per inning for him, and he gets the no luck. No decision in what continues to be a frustrating 2020 for us Phillies fans as this bullpen, it, it's just, it's soul crushing. It, it really is. I mean, they've got four losses and in three of the losses, 
it was the bullpen who came in when they were down maybe one run, two runs, and then all of a sudden you look and we're down five, we're down six, or it's tied and now we've lost in the matter of one inning in tonight's action. So the Yankees and Phillies split. New York goes to nine and two. The Phillies go to two and four, and they have one more game here coming up tomorrow before, uh, let's see, the Phillies have the Braves. And I'm not sure who the Yankees have here. I don't have it in front of me. But uh, going around to the Marlins and Orioles, like I said, the Marlins swept both games of the doubleheader starting out in game one, a one to nothing victory uh, and a home run by Anderson to right field that barely got over the fence was the only run of the game. And uh, watching the highlight here, man, this one snuck out to right field. Kind of crazy to to watch that be the only run. So uh, from the pitching side, Hernan, Vincent, Blair, Kinsler, they went shutout ball for the Marlins. Uh, from Baltimore's side of things, they just couldn't hit. They only had three hits in the game. Uh, but Cobb and Castro were solid on the bump. So Baltimore's offense wasn't able to come through. I, I mean, Miami's was held down as well. But they're going to get the one run home run, and it'll hold up. In a game one victory, and then in the uh, nightcap, the game two, it was two to one Miami. And again, these are seven innings, back to back, seven inning games. I myself in the Patriot League Division One college baseball, even we played seven nine double headers, seven nine seven nine. I, I think the big leaguers can do it too, uh, but seven innings, it, it's a different game. I mean, I talked about the Phillies Yankees Nola six innings. That's like getting eight innings in regards to uh, you know actual baseball. So. It's starter, pretty much closer when it comes to that type of action, and that leads to low-scoring games. So Miami wins one nothing, and then 2-1 to one in the second game. Aguilar hit a sack fly in the first. Anderson singled to take a 2 nothing lead, and then all Baltimore could get going was a single by Hayes uh, to score a run in the top of the six. So one run in two games for the Baltimore Orioles, not going to get it done offensively. Uh, their pitching staff wasn't too bad today, but uh, Miami's was just that much better. They went with bullpen by committee in game two. Five different guys were out on the bump for the win in the Marlins. But five and one, I, I don't know how, ma- how many does it take before we say, hey, I-, I guess they got a chance. I mean, if they get to nine and two and they play 500 ball the rest of the way, they're looking at a division win. So, uh, I mean, 10 games in, one sixth of the way in, we're over a month in here. I know they're only six games in, so that gives them kind of three weeks into the season as they're making up double headers. But just think about it. One game is like 2.7 or 2.8 games. So you sweep a double header today, you're basically on a five game win streak. If you're looking at it and rounding down, if you're being super positive, you're on a six game win streak. If you're the Miami Marlins and, and you just basically swept two series in a row to stand where we currently do. So just uh, amazing to think about with the Marlins playing good ball and good for them. It's fun to watch. Why not have yourselves a good time? So continuing around the East in the uh, scores and matchups, the New York Mets defeat the Washington Nationals three to one. The Mets improved to five and eight, still in last place in the NL East. The Nationals at four and five, continuing to just battle through a, a tough, tough early start to the season. Once again, Juan Sono back in the lineup. He went two for four today with an RBI. Uh, he had a solid day. He doubled in the top of the first, excuse me, the bottom of the first inning. Uh, and uh, what was his first at bat of the year for his uh, only RBI of the day? Washington's only run scored. Uh, the Mets in the top of the fourth got a single to score a run, and the seventh got an insurance run and, and won this one three to one in nine innings. So, it, oh man. And Washington, the big story is we talked about it, but Max Scherzer exited the game with an injury and it started off as a lower body injury now it has come out and been released here late wednesday that it is a hamstring strain so it is not arm related not back related all issues that scherzer has had in the past but the hamstring starts to go because this is a little tight than the hamstring and now when you're on a shortened season he's going to want to push it and rush back and depending on what grade strain it is in the hamstring These things could linger on for long amounts of time, whether it's two weeks, four weeks. And if you get to a month with this hamstring, like I said, this is only two and a half months long. So this could be one of those lingering issues that uh, really affects Scherzer. But you saw it as he came off the mound in the first inning, ground ball to first base. He tried to go over and cover and kind of came up limp and uh, didn't come back out for the second. So we knew something right then and there was wrong. 
And uh, it's just unfortunate because we've yet to see Steven Strasburg. He's battling some injuries, some wrist issues coming back off of being the World Series MVP. Juan Soto's been out for a couple of weeks. They've had multiple opt-outs. Now Scherzer is going to miss a week or two. And uh, if you're a Nationals fan, you're just having a bunch of tough luck right now uh, down there in the nation's capital. So uh, finishing up our NL East, the Atlanta Braves, they lose to the Toronto Blue Jays 2-1. to one. The Blue Jays improved to four and five. Atlanta fell to eight and five on the year. Toronto obviously behind in games because they were scheduled to play the Philadelphia Phillies this past week when the Phillies were unable to play due to their connection with the Miami Marlins and so on and so forth as we go here throughout 2020. Uh, the schedule's crazy if you look at it because originally these teams were supposed to be playing. Now they're playing them. So this is canceled because they're over here. And it's just, it's kind of fascinating. But another low-scoring matchup uh, in today's action. We talked about it. 2-1, to one, one nothing, 3-1, to one, now 2-1. to one. Uh, Jansen hit a sack fly for uh, Toronto in the top of the second. Biggio single to run in in the top of the fifth. And then uh, Diwali was the only home run from the Braves in the bottom of the seventh here. So the Atlanta's offense, let's see, Ryu held them at bay through uh, five innings. He had one hit, eight Ks. Hatch came in. He gave up the run. He gave up the long ball through an inning and a third. Uh, but then three gentlemen behind him. Let's see, Baraki, Romano, and Bass came in and shut down the Atlanta offense. So Atlanta continues to struggle. Uh, Swanson's hitting for him. Ozunia's hitting. Arnone's hitting. Uh, but Freeman struggling, only hitting a buck ninety. Riley's hitting one twenty nine. Acuna uh, Jr.'s only two forty. There's higher expectations at the top there, and then they're waiting to get uh, Marquez kind of back into the lineup. And then uh, the recent injury on the bound for Soraka. It, it just continues to be a tough go for the Braves as well as the Nationals. So the NL East is getting beat up, and then the Phillies just can't take advantage because their bullpen's terrible. The Mets are dealing with Diaz, Cano, and where the heck is Cespedes? It's crazy down there. So nobody in the NL East really wants to step up and take control of this division right now. Atlanta's trying to, but they're just having trouble staying healthy and performing. So Miami is the only team right now that's like, hey, they got it. They're locked in. They're rolling. Go with Miami. That, that's where you want to be. Uh, so it's just kind of fascinating to think about. But wrapping up the games here in the American League East, we had the Boston Red Sox beat the Tampa Bay Rays five to nothing. Boston improved to four and eight on the year. Tampa fell to five and seven. Fascinating to see Tampa unable to score any runs. Uh, Verdugo hit a home run for Boston, a two run shot. Chavez hit a two run shot in the sixth inning. Uh, sprinkle a couple of singles and runs in there for Boston, and you got yourself a five nothing victory. Uh, Perez went five scoreless for Boston, four strikeouts, 91 pitches. Brewer, Bryce, Barnes, Workman came in behind him to keep Tampa down. I mean, Tampa's offense, just there, there's nothing going on. We talked about it on Monday's episode about how they're struggling offensively and can't put anything together. And here we are. I mean, a few days later, Diaz, 211, Meadows, 250, Martinez, 267, Renfro, 184, 250, 077, 171. It's just anything down there for t Tampa Bay. They, they can't, can't get to, uh, can't get it in gear. I don't know. It's, it's frustrating. I thought they'd be locked in. I thought the offense would be much better. The pitching's been okay. It's just the offensive side that can't really get it in gear. So the AL East is the Yankees. And then everybody else, we'll see if the Orioles can continue to kind of finish in second because it guarantees you a playoff spot. So all you got to do is finish in second, even though right now you're under 500, you'd be in the postseason. And then on the National League side, of course, Miami, the surprise team at 5-1, and one, and then Atlanta sitting pretty at 8-5. and five. But that'll wrap things up here for the second segment of the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. We appreciate everybody listening out there. Let's pause for a word from one of our sponsors, one of our sister shows. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about the AL and NL Central. So stick around, everybody. We'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. <laughs> Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, and thanks for listening to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. This is episode number 229 of the Baseball Podcast here on Thursday, August 6th. I appreciate you guys listening. If you haven't checked out other podcasts offered by GSMC, do yourself a favor. We got everything, okay? There, there's a podcast for sports, news, politics, movies, music, cars, whatever it is, books, I don't know, whatever you're into, GSMC has a podcast for you. So if you enjoy listening to this podcast, getting new episodes every day pushed out to you here and you're into books or you like cars as well, check out those. So head to the search bar wherever you're listening to your podcast, type in GSMC. It'll give you the rest of the podcast network and you'll be able to follow and listen to a bunch of other great hosts like myself who are giving you guys quality information out there. So if you haven't done that yet, check that out. Follow us on social media, like, like, rate, subscribe, rate, review. I'm just putting them all together there for you and combining it into one word since it's 2020. And that's what you do for us content creators out here. But thanks for joining us here again today. This is the third segment. So we're going to jump into the central divisions both in the American League and the National League, talking about Wednesday's action here, where we currently stand in the American League. The uh, Minnesota Twins are at 10-2 and at the top of the division. They're playing great baseball here through the first couple of weeks. In second place, we have the Chicago White Sox at 7-4. and They were my surprise team for the American League. For those of you who have been with us for a few months here within the GSMC Baseball Podcast, I talked to you guys back in February, March, April, about my surprise teams, the White Sox being one of them. My surprise on the other side is the uh, Cincinnati Reds. We'll get to them in a second. Uh, but the White Sox have been good for me. So Chicago at 7-4, and four, Cleveland at third place at 7-6. and six. They won today, so they're back over 500. Fourth place, the Detroit Tigers at 5-5. Five and five. They haven't played in a couple of days. They were scheduled to play the St. Louis Cardinals this week, who obviously has been shut down to their outbreak. So no movement on the Tigers since we last spoke to you guys at 5-5. Five and five. And the Kansas City Royals are currently 3-10 and ten after they fall to the Chicago Cubs, or it looks like they're going to fall here. It's late in game action, so I'm making a brief assumption there. But according to the percentages, uh, it's up at 95.5 for the Cubbies to round this one out tonight and pull off the victory. So that would uh, that would make the Royals 3-10 and ten rounding out Wednesday evening here. For looking at the NL Central standings real quick, once again, the Cubbies should advance to 10-2. and two, Currently sit at 9-2 and two here. Late Wednesday evening. In second place, we have the St. Louis Cardinals at 2-3. and three. Again, it's amazing the differentiation in games. It's going to be 12 for the Cubbies. It'll be 5 for the Cardinals, so they've missed an entire week. They'll have a ton of doubleheaders coming up, so the Marlins, Phillies, all of them trying to catch up. But uh, put the Cardinals in there, too. The Cincinnati Reds, that was my surprise team. Like I said, they are 5-7. and seven. They are not playing good baseball. Their offense Hasn't been anywhere as efficient or effective as I thought it would be. Uh, Their rotation has been very, very good. That's why I picked them. I thought they'd ride those guys uh, to some success here, but unfortunately that hasn't been the case for them. And the Milwaukee Brewers at 3-5, and they were supposed to play the Cardinals before the Tigers, so they're not as many games behind, but they're still behind. And I I just don't see Milwaukee. Again, that was my prediction coming into the year was that they'd struggle just based on everybody they had lost. Uh, they did win tonight to improve to 3-5, and five, but still, I think the future there is a little bit bleak when it comes to the city of Milwaukee. And then the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, the Pirates are 2-10, and 10, 
And uh, I've talked to some of my friends out in Pittsburgh, and they tell me they are not as good as their record indicates. Okay, so again, this team is 2-10, and ten, and the locals say they're not as good as the record says they are. So we have another host here on the GSMC baseball team uh, from the great city out there, the city of Bridges, Pittsburgh, PA. So I'm sure he has a hot take on what's going on, but uh, my local friends say, uh, yeah, it, it's worse than that. So the summer of baseball is already over in the Steel City, and they're moving on to fall, and they're Steelers out, out there in Pittsburgh. So let's see. Diving into today's action, the Minnesota Twins defeated the Pirates. They swept the Pirates. They won 5-2. to two. They are now 10-2 and two on the season. Offensively, Max Kepler hitting .268. Uh, he's a positive, but Nelson Cruz continues to just mash baseballs i mean i'm rooting for this guy i just love following his career from texas to baltimore to now minnesota where was he in between there somewhere else for a year or two the past couple of years it's just the guys always hit and i loved watching him in baltimore and i love watching him now in minnesota so hitting 391 he was one for three last night uh let's see buxton got himself a hit he's now hitting 158 on the year on the bump uh, Dobnak, six uh, innings, scoreless ball here, three hits, only one strikeout, so very efficient. Even though he doesn't have strikeout stuff, lives in the zone and gets quick outs. Uh, that's impressive stuff when it comes to Dobnak. He now has a .6 ERA on the year, so he's been uh, super effective in the early on. On the Pittsburgh side of things, they just can't hit. I, I mean, if you look at the averages, 163, 167, 222, and that's about the tops. 220, 135, 053, 182, 154. Offensively, they just haven't been able to find anything. And even tonight, the only runs came on a bell home run uh, to center field in the bottom of the ninth inning. So it was five to nothing. This one was pretty much over. And then Bell, who went three of four to improve his average to 222, ran into one. So it's going to be a long summer out in Pittsburgh. Even the locals say it. But Minnesota's perspective, very impressive that they're 10-2. and two. I mean, Josh Donaldson sat out the other night, so he wasn't even in one of these games, and they were still able to ultimately get the victory. It's uh, It's been impressive stuff from that lineup. Nelson Cruz, a 40-year-old, like I said, it's good to see that happen in Minnesota. It's just going to be fascinating to see if they can finally get over the evil empire of the New York Yankees in the postseason because, I mean, even over the past five years, that's really been the hurdle that they have, uh, they've been unable to overcome. So continuing around the scoreboard, the Cleveland Indians won tonight 2 nothing over the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds' offense just could not get anything going against Clevinger. Clevinger went five and two-thirds, gave up two hits. Was a little bit wild tonight compared to outings past. He did have five walks and five innings and four strikeouts. Usually he's not that all over the place when it comes to his location. But he was able to work around the five walks because of only allowing two hits. Cincinnati, once again, those hits came from Akiyama and Castellanos. Castellanos is hitting the, the cover off the ball early on, 366. He was a big-time signing brought over from the Cubs last year, the Cubs and the White Sox. Now he finds himself in Cincinnati hitting in the middle of the lineup. He is not the reason why they're struggling. Suarez hitting 098 in the hot corner is a big reason why they're currently having trouble. Uh, some of the simulations and people had him potentially – uh, in the MVP race after the amount of home runs and success that he had last year for him to hit 098. It just seems like he's pressing a bit. Uh, he, he did take a step in the right direction today with a couple of walks. So didn't chase out of the zone, which is always a good thing. When you find yourself in a slump, you tend to be swinging at bad pitches and they call it pitch selection. As a hitter, you swing at the ones you shouldn't and you don't at the ones you should and you just can't get out of your own head and second guess yourself and it's trouble. So when you're able to see the ball well, see the ball out of the zone, get on base, you start to feel a little bit better about yourself. You're able to put together some good at bats and ultimately kind of carry some momentum here moving forward. But Cleveland offensively, they got to get things going a little bit. Hernandez and Ramirez at the top of the lineup hitting 302 and 277 are where they need to be. But Carlos Santana continues to struggle, hitting 171. Lindor 
only hitting 231. Uh, that's down for him. Reyes hitting a buck 63. So it's this reason why the guys are right around 500 because this rotation has been fantastic from Cleveland's perspective. And the same could be said for Cincinnati. Again, the rotation wasn't bad at all today. Four and a third for Mantone, one earned run. Lorenzen gave up an earned run in two innings, but the rest of the bullpen was good. Uh, so the pitching on both of these squads, where it needs to be, it's just the offense is trying to catch up here early in the season, which certainly makes sense because, you know, pitching's going to be ahead of hitting early on, and it's still considered early. And then you got the likes of the Cardinals, who who played for a week, and now they have a week off, and the Phillies and Marlins, who played for a weekend, and now they're playing again, and the Marlins won two games, scoring a total of three runs today. So that just goes to show you kind of where the offense currently sits in today's action here. So uh, rounding out the uh, Wednesday night's action in the Central Divisions, the Milwaukee Brewers beat the Chicago White Sox one to nothing. They improved to four and five. The White Sox fell to seven and five. On the year, the White Sox offensively just couldn't get it going. Hauser, seven scoreless innings for Milwaukee. His ERA is now .75 on the year. Phelps and Hayter closed things out in the seventh and eighth inning. Uh, Robert was one for four, for, so he continues to hit for Chicago. Moncada was back in the lineup. We discussed him earlier when we talked about some injuries. He was back in the lineup. However, Encarnacion was not out of both of those individuals who were poured, uh, pulled yesterday for concerns about shoulder is uh, issues. So Moncada's back, but uh, no dice tonight for the White Sox offensively. Dallas Keuchel, he was solid, locked in. I mean, seven innings, five hits, one run, eight Ks, one walk. Can't complain about that from the pitcher's perspective. Really only giving up an earned run in the third inning. Keuchel with a 2-5-5 ERA here through the early going, but... Milwaukee with a nice victory there, getting back into it, getting uh, the one nothing win, uh, positive interactions for Milwaukee as they're trying to bounce back here early on, just not having things bounce their way uh, from the get-go here. So, like I said, Cardinals and Tigers, they were postponed in the last game here. We have wrapping up. I told you I was making some assumptions earlier, but it is currently the top of the ninth, and the Chicago Cubs lead the Kansas City Royals. Four to one here. So let's dive into a little bit of tonight's action. The Royals took actually a one nothing lead in the third inning. The Cubs were able to bounce back with two runs in the fourth. Baez singled. Contreras grounded into a double play, which scored a run. And then Chicago extended its lead in the top of the ninth with a Baez, another single, and Contreras uh, a double to right field. So the Cubbies just added another one here in the top of the ninth. A single to right field makes it five to one. As again, it looks like they will advance to 10 and 2 here in the Central Division. So let's see how Chris Bryant's doing here tonight. He struggled so far. He is currently one for four, does have a couple of runs scored, uh, but is still hitting 171 early on in the year. On a pitching perspective, you Darvish, solid for Chicago again. Good for you bouncing back and having a solid start to his 2020 season. He went seven innings, gave up five hits, one run, one walk, four strikeouts for a 2 1 2. ERA. It's good to see that because I was worried about his career potentially coming down the stretch last year. I mean, it just, it didn't look good based on his statistics and where he was performing, but he really put in time this off season and has come back and, and is somebody that has shown, Hey, I'm again, one of the top pitchers in baseball. This is why you spent the money on me. This is why you let other guys walk. This is why you let Arietta go and decided on you Darvish. And now it looks like you is actually going to be the better of those two for the length of the contract, which didn't look to be the case even a year or two ago. So fascinating to see him bounce back and good for you moving forward here. But that basically wraps up what we have going on in the Central Division just because, again, the Tigers are currently sitting out the past couple of days here uh, along with the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Let's pull up the Cardinals schedule to see who are they uh, coming back to play on Friday. And let's see if I can click on this one here. It's tough because a lot of times it says canceled here, canceled there, because it's just ever evolving and currently changing. So they got postponed against Milwaukee and Detroit, and they will be coming back against Chicago and Pittsburgh moving forward. So Chicago and Pittsburgh up next for St. Louis in regards to the Tigers and who they have out of the break here as they're supposed to return. After being postponed against the Cardinals, they had a day off, and they find themselves 
at Pittsburgh starting on Friday. So they'll be off one more day here through Thursday and then coming back to face Pittsburgh. But overall thoughts and impressions on the Central. The Twins playing really good baseball. We knew they'd be at the top of the division. 10-2 and two is probably better than we had anticipated through the first 12 games, but certainly not outrageous when it came to uh, the potential outcomes. The White Sox at 7-6 and six or 7-4. and four. That's right around where I thought they'd be. I, I think they're going to be a good ball club if they keep getting pitching like they should. That offense is going to mash baseballs. They're certainly going to find themselves in the postseason. And then the Indians, right around 7-6. and six. I mean, their pitching staff has been great, but the offense just can't get anything going. Carlos Santana, Francisco Lindor, I mean, big-time talents who are really struggling offensively. It's just a surprise in the American League Central. And then the National League Central, everybody under 500 except for the Cubbies is just crazy to think about. I mean, the National League, we talked about it in the East. Uh, the Marlins and Braves, everybody else under 500. Well, same in the Central. 10 and 2 Cubbies, 2 and 3 Cardinals, 5 and 7, 3 and 5, 2 and 10. I don't think the Brewers will be above 500. Pittsburgh stinks. Cincinnati's not playing good ball, so they could be under 500 as well. I do think the Cardinals eventually get there. I mean, two and three early is just due to the suspensions. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Early on, the NL Central not looking very strong. And the Cubbies uh, certainly surprising me since I was taking the under on the win total. And now with 10 through 12 games, uh, they're definitely projected to hit the over. But that'll wrap things up here for the third segment of the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. We're going to pause right now for a word from one of our sponsors, one of our sister shows. But when we come back, we're going to wrap up today's episode talking about the games out west. What's going on on the West Coast? Late night stuff. So stick around, everybody. We'll be right back. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. Thanks again for listening, everybody, to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. This is episode number 229 on Thursday, August 6th. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed the episode so far. We've discussed the American League, National League Central. We've talked about the Eastern Divisions. we talked about news, notes, injuries. Mike Trout going yard, first game back after his wife gives birth to their son. We touched about it all, and now... In our fourth and final segment, we're going to wrap things up by talking about the Western Division. Starting out with the American League West, jumping right into it here. Current standings now. Based on time of recording, coming up on almost midnight here Wednesday night, all of the Western games are still in action. They are still being played. So these standings are based of games being completed on Tuesday night. Uh, but the Athletics are in first place at 7-4. and four. Followed by the Astros at six and four. Uh, the following three teams are under 500: the Angels, Rangers, and Mariners. Four and seven, three and six, and four and eight. So really, nothing to worry about when it comes to anybody outside of Houston and Oakland in the American League West and in the National League West. Uh, a lot more to talk about here, and that's the Colorado Rockies, who are the surprise team uh, in the National League, along with the Miami Marlins. I guess we can say now that they swept today and got to five and one, things are getting a little bit more serious now that it's beyond just two and one opening weekend in Miami. But Colorado being eight and two through 10 games, it, it, you could have won a lot of money if you would have said, Hey, they're going to win eight of their first 10. I think a lot of people would have taken that bet against you. So if you did out there, shout out to you. Uh, but the LA Dodgers in second place at eight and four. San Diego Padres in third at seven and five. Uh, they've been a pleasant surprise early on as well. The Giants coming in at fourth place at five and seven. And then the Arizona Diamondbacks, uh, definitely a disappointing 
three and eight thus far. I mean, we touched on disappointments in the National League. The Mets have to be up there at five and eight so far. And the Arizona Diamondbacks at three and eight. I mean, there's a couple of them right around 500 you could certainly talk about, but those two that far under 500 are definitely surprising here early on. But look at it live action here as of Wednesday night. Uh, games here that are furthest along. The Giants and Rockies are late in the action. It is four to three Giants as the Giants will look to uh, make Colorado eight and three on the year like we touched on it. Let's look here in Colorado, how they're doing it. I mean, Trevor Story's been solid so far, hitting 275. Uh, Corey Blackman hitting 386. Hey, he's been raking offensively. Nolan Arenado hitting 250. Daniel Murphy, 313. Uh, but the pitching staff has really been the surprise. I mean, tonight, Gray gave up three earned runs over six innings. His ERA, 331. Uh, but uh, the Giants here do have a 4-3 to three lead on a uh, Flores single in the sixth to give them uh, the big lead. But the big uh, big uh, damage done here, sorry, is Belt homering to right field. So Brandon Belt hit a three-run home run. That was the big bomb of the day uh, to uh, give them the win in regards to tonight's action if they can hang on against the Rockies down the stretch here. But bottom of the eighth currently, they have a 4-3 to three lead, and that will be a big win for San Francisco. Next game up is the uh, Diamondbacks versus the Astros. And uh, this one, hopefully you found yourself taking the over because it is currently 11-6 to Diamondbacks here in the fifth inning. I mean, a lot of runs being scored so far. Houston jumped out to an early 4 nothing lead. Tucker homered, Toro homered. But then Arizona bounced right back in the fourth inning with a nine-run fourth inning. Calhoun homered, Peralta tripled, Voigt doubled, Marte doubled, Calhoun singled, Walker singled to make it 9-4. Springer then homered for uh, Houston to bring them back to 9-6. And then Ahmed hit a home run for Arizona to advance it to 11-6. So uh, the box score reading very nice on uh, Arizona side of things. I mean, looking at the first four guys in the lineup here currently, they are a combined 3, 5, 6, 8, 4, 4, 8, 10, 13. 8 for 13 is 1 through 4 in Houston's lineup, or excuse me, Arizona's lineup against Houston's pitching, which was uh, McCullers getting hit around, giving up 8 earned runs in 3.2 thirds. His ERA, 9.22. Coming back off that Tommy John surgery, he's trying to find his way here just a little bit. Uh, Verlander missing in the rotation. They made a move to add somebody from Boston to the rotation. Rodriguez gave up three runs in an inning. Uh, Roberto Ozuna for Houston potentially is going to need Tommy John surgery. This is a big deal, obviously, just due to the date. I found myself thinking, oh, well, the season just started. He'll be back in time for next year. And then I had to rewire my brain and realize that it's uh, the middle of August almost by the time he's going to have the surgery. So not only is he going to miss 2020, but he's going to miss all of 2021. This is going to be a two-year injury at this point just based on the rehab of 9 to 12 months. Even if it is nine months, you're looking at the end of next year. So I think they're going to give it a year, go the safe route, get to like 15 months, have him ready to come back 2022. But this now means that Ryan Presley will be inserted into the closer's role here for his first opportunity at long-term sustained success in the closer's role as – He's found himself uh, very pleasantly in the eighth inning role having success. He's got a, a three saves in his career, and now he's going to be the closer on a, a team that's trying to win the American League West and trying to win the World Series. So shout out to my buddy Ryan Presley. He's going to get an opportunity. He's also dealing with some elbow tenderness, some tightness. He's got a blister on his finger. There's a lot going on down in Houston, and there's a lot going on in, in a lot of these locker rooms that people are trying to figure out. As we continue to, uh, you know, navigate the waters here of the baseball season of 2020. So the Texas Rangers are up four to three on the Oakland Athletics at the top of the seventh inning as we currently stand. This would certainly be an upset as Texas is three and six. Oakland, as I mentioned, first place in the AL West at uh, seven and four. So Houston and Oakland both trailing currently, which allows the rest of the division to try to catch up some ground in regards to the offense here tonight. Houston. They got out to our uh, Texas got out to a one nothing lead. Chu hit a home run. Olsen bounced back in the bottom of the first for Oakland. He hit a two run dinger and then Solak doubled to make it two to two. Kinar Falefa reached on an infield single to make it three to two Texas. And now it is currently four to three here 
as we had a sack fly and a home run by Loreno for Oakland to pull them back within one. And, uh, man, it's just Oakland at 7-4. and four, They're a good ball club. Manesa gave up four earned runs in three innings. Smith came in. He threw a scoreless three innings. He really stabilized thing. Uh, Gibby Gibson for Texas on the mound. He's given up three earned runs in six innings. Another solid outing for Gibby. Always a positive thing to see down there. As we round about the uh, uh, the West here, the Dodgers are up seven to two in the sixth inning over the Padres. They should improve to eight and five. San Diego should fall to seven and six. San Diego's been fun to watch so far. I, I mean, I got to be honest with you. Fernando Tatis Jr. He continues to mash baseballs. He's two and three. His average is up to, or he's two for three tonight. His average is up to three hundred for the year. You got Tommy Pham hitting in the middle of the lineup at two thirty. Machado is really struggling out there. It's uh, it's amazing to see. He really hasn't been the same guy since he signed that contract, at least from an outside perspective. I mean, the Philadelphia Phillies were involved. They had him on site. They did the whole recruiting pitch. Machado, Harper, both of them. Who's it going to be? They ultimately decided Bryce Harper, Chopper, or Machado goes out west, which is why we don't get to see him as often, as clearly it's uh, you know coming up towards midnight here, and uh, they're still playing in the bottom of the sixth inning. So guys like myself who stay up and do things like this for a living, are able to see him and be entertained. But the casual fan on the East Coast isn't seeing Machado and doesn't realize that he's hitting 208 here as Harper went yard once again today. So the Phillies made the right decision there, at least through a year and a half in regards to who they should sign. Uh, but Will Myers for the Padres hitting 286. He's fun to watch offensively. Today's action on the mound for Richards getting hit around five innings, four runs. The Dodgers put a hurting on him. The Dodgers offense continues to be stacked. Some guys still struggling early on here, like Cody Bellinger. He's 0 for 3 again tonight so far, hitting 173 on the year. Uh, there was a lot of talk about how he had an MVP season, and then this offseason continued to look for adjustments, continued to look to improve on last year. And it's just like, man, I don't know. Sometimes when it works, you know, maybe you shouldn't change things. Maybe you should just kind of. Keep rolling with what you've been doing because winning MVPs really aren't a bad thing. So maybe he gets back to the drawing board here, revisits 2019, and ultimately some of the uh, mechanics he was using and is able to find some success here in the near future. But Max Muncy only hitting a buck 80. He's struggling as well. Uh, but they're being carried by Corey Seeger, who's hitting 354, AJ Pollock hitting 333, Justin Turner hitting 240 in the middle of the lineup. Uh, so uh, basically, L.A., just their depth is is proving to be too much for the rest of the division as Colorado and uh, San Diego are having good starts. But I just think L.A., over the course of at least 60 games, will certainly find themselves at the top of the division. The last game of the night here is between the Seattle Mariners and the L.A. Angels. 4-8 and eight Seattle against 4-7 and seven L.A. Seattle currently leads 4-1 to one in the bottom of the fifth inning as uh, J.P. Crawford continues to perform at the top of the lineup. He's two, uh, one for two, hitting two ninety five. Uh, Moore out in left field, hitting three fifty seven. Lewis in center field seems to be uh, somebody that they can build around in Seattle out there for years to come. He's hitting three seventy three. Kyle Seeger's hitting three eighteen. Uh, Nola, Aaron Nola's brother out there is hitting two seventy six. So the top end of that lineup performing – but then you go to the bottom side, and you got 105, 109, 080. Uh, so really top-heavy in Seattle. But honestly, that top side is more than I thought they would have. And 4-8 and eight has definitely improved on where I had them. I had them with the uh, the Pirates at, at kind of that 2-10 and 10 mark down at the bottom. So uh, Mike Trout's 0 for 2 tonight. He's hitting 276. Fletcher's hitting 341. Rendon's only hitting a buck 54. Man, I didn't realize Rendon was struggling that much out there, whether it's adjusting to the new time zone, his new, uh, you know, surroundings, whatever it is, a buck 54 just isn't great for a, a huge signing in the off season for them. That's obviously why they're struggling early on. Albert Pujols is hitting a buck 47. I don't know if it's time for him to ultimately hang him up. Upton hitting 128, another one of their veterans that they're expecting more out of. Uh, they just called up Joe Adele. He's 0 for 2 tonight, hitting 167 here early on. He's a top five prospect in all of baseball that they're hoping can kind of jumpstart this offense. But things just haven't gone their way out in L.A. Uh, again, they're old with pool hosts. They're old with um, Upton. And, and those guys just, 
you know, haven't bounced back the way they expected them to or the way they wanted them to here in 2020. But rounding out today's episode, talking about the playoff standings, I always like to give kind of an update on where we're at here. Uh, now the top two in each division are qualifying for the playoffs and then two wild cards beyond that. So once again, in the American League, we are currently looking at, as of the top two, the Yankees and the Orioles in the Central, the Twins, White Sox, out West, the Athletics and Astros, all of those names about standard outside of the Orioles. You thought the Rays would be there. But the two wild card teams currently are the seven and six Indians. And then lastly, the five and five Tigers. They would be a half a game in over the Baltimore Orioles and Toronto Blue Jays. So the Tigers in the playoffs, Baltimore now finds themselves on the outside looking in after getting swept in a doubleheader here on Wednesday, which is just fascinating because five and four gets you in, five and six, you're out. That's going to be the kind of way it is this summer with, uh, you know, only 60 games. It's going to feel almost like football where you're coming down the stretch and you're counting every game to see where people are at. So looking at the National League, the, uh, the National League East, Miami and Atlanta, your top two. Getting in and automatically qualifying for the playoffs. In the uh, National League Central, you got the Cubs and then the Brewers at four and five. So under 500, but currently second in the division and qualifying for the playoffs is the Milwaukee Brewers. In the West, you have the Rockies and the Dodgers in the top two. They, they will remain the top two even after tonight's uh, conclusion of their games. And then in wild card action, the Padres will remain in the wild card no matter where they finish. And then it will be either the four and five nationals or the two and three Cardinals. It looks like the four and five nationals based on winning percentage would be getting in. So right now, if the playoffs started today in the national league, you would have two teams with records under 500 advancing to the playoffs. That's not the case in the American league with your five and five tigers wrapping out the eighth and final spot in the national league. You got the nationals at four and five as your last wild card and Milwaukee at four and five as your number two coming out of the National League Central. So pretty fascinating and something to keep an eye out on if one division really overtakes the other because the American League West is struggling because the National League West is performing so well and vice versa in some of the other divisions. But that'll wrap it up, guys, for today's episode. I really appreciate you listening in here on Thursday, August 6th. Again, if you haven't done so already, check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Twitter. GSMC Baseball Podcast, as well as please rate, uh, review the podcast, subscribe, share it with your friends. I ask you guys every episode to try to text this to one of your buddies out there. Say, hey, have you listened to this baseball podcast in a minute? It's pretty solid. Kevin's on every Monday and Thursday. If you want to check out his episode specifically, that's the way to go. He brings the energy. He brings the entertainment. He brings the quality content. But that'll wrap things up for today. I appreciate you guys riding with me once again here. Follow us across the board. Share us with your friends. But most importantly, enjoy yourself. Be happy. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'll talk to you again soon. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also find Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.